Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Daniel Rosal here bringing you a video from uh, a random couch in Jerusalem. Now I have explained in a couple of videos, people who've actually subscribed to me are gonna be like, I can't believe he's making this statement again, but I'm gonna do it one more time. I have been working hard over the past month or so to decrease the sheer randomness of this YouTube channel from talking about every topic under the sun to an actual couple of themes. The themes I'm going for, and I say this for people who may want to subscribe in the future, you're already part of the subscriber community. It's going to be about Jerusalem, Israel, and interesting stuff going on here. I know it's not the most super unique uh, theme, but that is what we're going to be shooting for. And I'm trying to put all these other random videos about completely different topics into like different boxes or buckets or channels on YouTube but bear with me, it's a work in progress. So I interrupt the regular programming about Jerusalem and kebabs and whatnot to talk about, instead of Jerusalem today, you're gonna hear about something called abdominophrenic dysinergia, APD. Now, I thought this video was really important to make for a few reasons. Number one, I've personally been struggling with this for three years and I finally got like a name for this uh, condition about three months ago from my gastroenterologist. Previously, it was like you have something called functional dyspepsia and I've done videos about that, a couple of videos. I've interviewed a couple of really, really world leading experts for this YouTube channel. For those interested, um, check out, I'll put a couple of links in the description. And secondly, because I'm kind of in a slightly advantaged position in the sense that one of those experts who came on the channel was a very bright, young Greek American gastro by the name of John Damianos, who tweets a lot and he tweets amazing stuff. And he tweeted a few days ago that he and colleagues had got a paper published, Abdomino Dysophrenic Dysinergia, Dysinergia, a nar APD, a narrative review, not a, perhaps bedtime reading rather than uh, if you're looking for your next uh, th a thriller, published in the official journal of the American College of Gastroenterology. That's like a really big deal. So this is like legit. Combining those two facts, number one, I'm a patient, not a doctor, but there's very, very little information about abdominophrenic dysinergia out there on the internet which is why I specifically wanted to make a video about it to tell folks who really have just heard this word from their doctor the basic things I heard from my gastro who's a neurogastro and a super knowledgeable guy in the field and what I've learned or the 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 little bit, the nuggets I've gleaned from following John on Twitter especially the stuff he's been tweeting recently. Now my impression I don't, I, I'm not, I may actually not have to like put that disclaimer there, my impression. I think this is probably something that most people would, uh, would agree upon. That in the world, in this fascinating world of gastroenterology, which as a patient, I've been uh, sort of, I was going to say thrust into, but forced to learn a little bit about more than I probably would like to over the past year, there's been this growing um, sort of understanding that when people deal with chronic bloating, not all bloating is due to excessive gas. So the traditional understanding has been that, well, if you have people like me or anyone else for that matter, who's like bloated all the time, like what is wrong with this person in simple language? A common premise has been, well, they've obviously got like a bunch of gas in their uh, stomach and these conditions like SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth have been really like investigated. And there's probably been a bit of uh, perhaps pseudoscience uh, enter the picture as well about them. And in recent years, through basically some research, it's become uh, increasingly clear that when folks are chronically bloated, it's not necessarily they've done, I've seen interesting studies where they look at the volume of gas between a healthy control and someone with one of these bloating problems, and there's very little in it. So the answer is not air, essentially. And that's prompted a search for other answers. And this, one of the promising directions has been abdominophrenic dysinergia or an explanation for it. Now, something that I think is interesting and again, why I wanted to make this video specifically now is that this is really like new research uh, being put out there. This um, article and I'll link to it in the description uh, from the AGC was published, if I'm not mistaken, only this year, like just now, literally in January of 2023. So this is very much sort of emerging research and emerging understanding. For those, just a couple more things in the prelude and I'll, I'll timestamp this video so, so people can skip through because I'm really just trying to do sort of a brain dump of sorts here. 
roughly where this fits, this abdominophrenic dyssynergia, and I'll explain sort of basically what that is just in a just in a small bit, is within this class of disorders called DGBIs. DGBI stands for Disorders of Gr- of Brain Gut DBG I inter action. Brain gut disorder is what traditionally has been called functional, as in functional dyspepsia. Something about the link between the brain, the, the brain, your brain up here, and the way your um, your gastrointestinal tract operates has gone basically wrong. The analogy that 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 I use if I were asking, if I were trying to explain to my doctor what having this actually feels like on a daily basis, I don't know if anyone on the, who watches this video has ever experienced the transmission belt i may be getting the exact term wrong in their car when that breaks and the car becomes really jerky and sort of and that's to me what it feels like it's like i can feel all this stuff going on in my stomach that i just wasn't sensation that i didn't have before it feels like something that connection is like sort of broken trying to keep this video in some kind of coherent order abdominophrenic dyssynergia the clue is in the name abdomino refers to and preface again with the not a doctor stuff so this is not medical information this is just my understanding but in the interest of putting information out there for people who are trying to understand what on earth this is abdomino abdominal muscles phrenic related to the diaphragm dyssynergia related to a faulty spread of information of uh, energy between these two uh, organs, right? The abdominal muscles and the diaphragm, which is also a muscle. Sort of useful thing about having this term is to, uh, one obviously hopes it brings them closer to actually doing something about it. John tweeted, and I'll put a link to his, descri- his Twitter, it's amazing, this little graphic yesterday, I will put it, I will do a high-tech rendering, I'll put it actually up on the screen as well as this super uh, super low-tech methodology I'm using right now. Uh, but it's it explains a normal condition, like how stuff is supposed to be and what goes wrong when you have this. So on the left, he has what goes wrong and it says chest down, abdomen out. So basically what this condition is about is that the coordination, the, 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 the teamwork between these two muscles has broken. And that's, and that's why your stomach is like bulging after you eat, right? So in the pathological condition, the abdomen is out and the chest is down. Doctors who under, actually understand anatomy can fill in the details for me. I think that means that the diaphragm is relaxed when it's supposed to be contracting, I think. Um, and that's why also when you have this, you get like kind of shortness of breath, I think. And in the correct operation of the two muscles you have abdomen in and chest up right so you basically relax and you get that like what i found in my three years of dealing with this for me to rehash old uh, stuff i've talked about before started after having my gallbladder surgery i don't know if there is an established connection yet between like specific surgeries like abdominal surgeries and this thing but that's how it actually began for me for me water is like the worst thing but essentially everything I eat or drink tends to cause bloating much more than it did. But it was a light bulb moment when I realized that because water is the very worst thing, it's not related to nutrients, it's not related to a food group, right? Water is kind of a nerd, it's just water. So that was, I think, when I when my doctor was asking me, well, you say you're bloated all the time, is it like liquids, foods, what is it exactly? And I was like, it's actually everything. But water is worse. Now, why is water worse than foods for me? And I think I've heard this from other people with functional dyspepsia and uh, gastroparesis. I think that's an unsolved mystery, but it's, uh, it's, it's there as a thing. Now, what I'm going to do for the rest of this video is just give a skim through this paper to pick out what I think are, you know, sort of interesting things. And I'll put the full text in the description. So tidbit one that I don't want to miss um, regarding this emerging sort of clinical entity of abdominophrenic dyssynergia, APD, the people to follow, because it's always good to follow if you're looking for answers, people who are doing really good research in this. There's two people. Firstly is John Damianos, who's incoming to the Mayo Clinic, I believe. And there's a Spanish doctor based out of Barcelona, a guy called Fernando Aspiroth. And I really hope uh, to Fernando, I'm doing the Spanish pronunciation justice there. These guys have together been doing a lot of research and they're both worth, it's both worth keeping on top of their, their work. So there's a few very interesting uh, tidbits in here and it really talks about how the um, how this all works, this kind of 
gut brain dysregulated uh, interaction stuff. So there's an interesting, uh, this is on page two of their paper. It says, furthermore, ingestion of lettuce, which is like lettuce, right? As in the lettuce you put in burgers, which is a low gas releasing substrate for microbial fermentation led to abdominal distension produced by uncoordinated activity of the abdominal wall in patients who believed that eating lettuce would cause them gas and bloating, suggesting that distension, distension is when your belly gets observably big, is a behavioral response. More recent, uh, more recently, a study in healthy volunteers demonstrated that voluntary contraction of the diaphragm is associated with abdominal distension and symptoms of bloating and abdominal discomfort. So I hope so far in the video I've covered to the best to the best degree that I can with all those caveats by not being a doctor and just being someone with this trying to piece together the info from these disparate sources but including this very very useful paper. I hope I piece together basically what this is, what doctors know about why it occurs. Again as a reminder it's in the name, it's the faulty coordination between the diaphragm and the abdominal wall. But let's leave all the detail and nuance to the experts because if you're in my situation, you're a patient and really all you want to have happen is for this to go away. So what are the possible treatment options? So I'm gonna jump forward a little bit to treatment and just some uh, treatments and just summarize what these guys um, have sort of pointed the way to in this paper. The first of these is EMG biofeedback and at the risk of uh, breaking the copyright of the American Journal of Gastroenterology, I'm just gonna actually read directly here from the paper. Patients in the study used EMG activity as a visual signal for biofeedback. Using the real-time EMG signal, they were able to decrease EMG activity for the diaphragm and intercostal muscles. And this response was associated with the ascension of the diagram, which as far as I know is what should be happening, reduction in abdominal girth, and improvement in the subjective sensation of abdominal uh, distension. Similarly, in a subsequent placebo-controlled trial, Barba et al. found that the biofeedback technique enabled patients with various DGBIs and symptoms of postprandial bloating to reduce intercostal muscle activity and increase dist and uh, increase anterior walmus activity, thereby reducing the sensation of abdominal distension and perceived girth. These data, I love when people use data correctly in the plural, it's wonderful. These data indicate that patients can be trained to control abdominophrenic postural tone, release the, di release the diaphragmatic blockade and correct abdominal distension. Hence, biofeedback may be useful to correct APD and abdominal distension. However, the E, now here, here's the catch guys. However, the EMG technique used is complex and expensive. And there is currently extremely limited access and no standardized protocols. So that's the good and the bad. The good being that it seemed in these um, clinical trials that with EMG directed biofeedback, folks with APD were able to actually tangibly physically reduce their bloating and the negative part is that as of this current time this is not something you can rock up to your doctor and be like oh amazing I've had this thing and uh, I've, I've heard about this new condition called APD or you like understand better so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take the biofeedback please so it's, it's not something right now that like is in widespread clinical use and there's also no standardized protocol so there's two separate issues there basically. The second uh, potential treatment course that this paper directs to is diaphragmatic breathing. And again, rather than sort of me rehash the science um, elucidated here with probably varying degrees of uh, accuracy, I'm just going to read straight from their paper. Diaphragmatic breathing is effective for treating aerophagia, belching and rumination syndrome. This technique may also be effective for the management of bloating because it targets the maladaptive somatic response. Patients are instructed to inhale slowly while protruding the abdomen, avoiding chest rise, and then exhale. Diaphragmatic breathing is indicated for 30 minutes after meals, placing one hand over the chest and the other uh, over the abdomen. A major benefit is that it is easy to learn and can be performed at home. So right now, given that this EMG directed biofeedback is not something that we can just like sort of get access to, at least one can learn a, a diaphragmatic breathing. I'm currently watching YouTube videos and um, I'm gonna actually start this 30 minute thing when I uh, when I get a bit more, a bit of time. 
there is always there should always be time for diaphragmatic breathing in one's life um many gastros physical therapists and psychologists are also familiar with this technique making it much more easily accessible for patients but its value for the treatment of apd has not been established the final treatment methodology uh, that this group of doctors mention in this interesting paper is they kind of say well the FODMAP diet diet might work CBT might work gut directed hypnotherapy might work um, and then also neuromodulators now I'll put a link to my my interview with uh, with uh, Dr. John Damianos because I personally learned a lot from it and neuromodulators refers to basically psychiatric meds that are used in typically lower dosages for the treatment of functional dyspepsia and uh, or using the more updated terminology, the DGBIs, the disorders of gut brain interaction. And the, you know, the classic ones that most people who've been dealing with this, and again, you're gonna have to excuse my language for a second, crappy condition, whatever uh, whatever one is, is, less, uh, is less inflammatory and insulting maybe. It's, an, it's really, really an, an annoying thing to live with. Are amitriptyline and nortriptyline, the drugs that are called the a tricyclic antidepressants but they say in this uh in this paper certain uh, central neuromodulators and when when these drugs are used for uh controlling these uh dgbi symptoms are not we they're not called by doctors antidepressants they're called neuromodulators that was what john taught me thank you john central neuromodulators such as atypical antidepressants and oh this is a hard word gaba pen gaba pentanoids are useful for DGBI symptoms. A recent placebo-controlled trial of 85 patients with IBS showed that treatment with pregalbin 225 milligrams twice daily significantly improved abdominal bloating. However, the role of neuromodulators in visible abdominal distension and APD remains to be established. And uh, for the footnote, for those really looking to track down um, the everything that came out of this uh, the literature review that's footnote uh, 32. CBT seems promising because it targets maladaptive behaviors and helps regulate psychological and psycho psychological responses to emotional and physical uh, stimuli. Okay, now to wrap up the video, I'm going to just read conclusion and future directions. That's the very last. It's not. I, I, I recommend folks who have this and are trying to learn about this. People may have uh, disagree that reading literature or material intended for doctors is a is a worthwhile or, or, or smart thing to do as a patient. Personally, um, I think if you do it with the understanding that you're not a doctor and some of this is gonna go above your head, but I still think personally there's a lot of value in it. So uh, I'm gonna just read off directly again their conclusions and future directions because uh, this, this concludes the paper. APD, abdominophrenic dysinertia in full, is characterized by the pathologic contraction and descent of the diaphragm and relaxation and protrusion of the abdominal wall. A series of studies indicate that this abnormal response contributes to distension in DGBIs, including IBS, FD, and functional bloating and distension. There are currently no diagnostic criteria for APD. Dynamic cross-sectional imaging can identify APD, but less expensive and easily accessible technologies, such as ultrasound, may be more useful in identifying and even treating APD. There are promising data to support the use of biofeedback to treat APD, but there are currently no standardized treatment protocols and access to biofeedback is limited. Adjunctive treatments targeting central sensitization and visceral hypersensitivity may also be helpful with the growing appreciation of APD, and I think they mean appreciation in the, in the sense of it's becoming more understood, not that anyone's really grateful for. Uh, it certainly has this for the existence of this condition. Uh, with the growing appreciation of APD and its con contribution to DGBIs, future efforts should increase the understanding of APD, develop standardized diagnostic criteria, criteria and proposed, propose evidence-based uh, treatments, which is, of course, the whole mantra of uh, traditional allopathic uh, medicine. If you have... Uh, APD, uh, one of the DGBI's emerging clinical entity. Uh, I hope this has been just of some value. I will link to the uh, full paper, as I mentioned a couple of times now. Two people I recommend following, uh, besides Dr. John, who I'm trying not to keep mentioning, unless I sound like a bit of a stalker. I'm not stalking you, John, but your Twitter is terrific. And uh, anyone who has one of these conditions, whether it's IBS or FD or this APD, um, it's really useful because he tweets a lot of 
new stuff coming out in terms of research. And the second group is a uh, organization called the Rome Foundation, which sort of attempts to put together the jigsaw of research being done in these directions, advocacy for patients and all that kind of good stuff. And they have a really, really terrific website and a newsletter and lots of info. Of course, as someone with this myself, I don't recommend spending one's entire life uh, thinking about this. <clears throat> Do what you can. Anyone, I think that one of the good things from this paper, the encouraging things is abdominal breathing because you don't need a doctor's prescription. You can teach it to yourself now after watching this video i guess all we can do is really hope that uh treatments really emerge uh for this thanks for watching again this youtube channel is not about gastroenterology or uh my health struggles or or, or apd or anything um but uh if you do for other reasons because you're curious about the other stuff that i post uh want to subscribe here uh, to me on youtube hit that subscribe button uh thank you guys very much for watching